Hey, welcome back. With the state of public discourse these days, it may seem like you can't say anything for fear of offending someone, getting canceled, or even losing a friend. But that's no way to have a healthy society. In their new book, Say the Right Thing, authors Kenji Yoshino and David Glasgow share ways that we can you know, use language to unite each other rather than divide. Good morning to both of you. Thank you for being here. Thanks so much for having us. It's about time someone wrote this book. Uh, we've been needing to address this, to talk about this for a long time, but you've said that this book came from mistakes others have made, uh, that you have made. Tell me why it was in time for you both to write this. Yeah, so we say in the book, uh, Amity, that really this comes from our own mistakes. So I personally, speaking only for myself, have misgendered colleagues. I have confused two people of the same demographic group with each other and called them by each other's names. I've laughed at inappropriate jokes. And so I was living in fear, right, of saying the wrong thing. And so we decided as directors of uh, Center on Diversity and Inclusion and Belonging that it was time to actually see what was out there. We couldn't find anything that would serve as a guide. And so we just collected all of the tips and tricks in this area that we knew of uh, in order to help people have more conversations because as you say when we're in that kind of crouch of fear we're yeah. actually not stepping in to be good allies or good colleagues we're not we're afraid of saying the wrong thing we're afraid of, of, of doing anything so I'm glad that, that you've done this you wrote this together though what did I both of you bring to the discussion yeah, well, we do have some, you know, demographic differences. So uh, Kenji is from Gen X and I'm a millennial. And so I think we had a slightly different perspective there. I'm white, Kenji is Asian American. Uh, but we really wanted to write this book uh, in a united voice, right, as we, yeah. uh, because we do share a lot of the same outlook. And I think what unites us is that we both see these issues from a bridge. So we find that often members of marginalized groups, so LGBTQ people, women, people of color, come to us seeking our allyship and support and also men, white individuals, people from more dominant social groups also come to us and share candidly their fear that the pendulum has swung too far against them. And so I think we have a bit of a unique perspective on that. Well, I love that you are just talking about all the things that no one is, is uh, everyone's afraid to talk about. We need to start to turn this stuff up and examine it. Um, in Say the Right Thing, you say that we need to hit the pause button on cancel culture. Let's talk about that. Yeah, so we worry a lot about cancel culture. We actually admire the original ideal uh, behind it, which mm -hmm. is like it's kind of a break glass moment after the murder of George Floyd, trying to live up to our values yes. as a egalitarian society, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, after you break the glass, there needs to be a tool behind the glass, right? They actually <laughs> use subsequently. Yeah. So the things that worry about uh, us about cancel culture are really two things. One is that it's like overly and disproportionately punitive, like you mm -hmm. can make one mistake, say you make a mistake on air, and that yep. could be the end of your career, right? And mm -hmm. we think that that's not a really healthy uh, way to conduct ourselves as a society. And then the other thing that we worry about is that cancel culture doesn't really give skills. It's either like you're here or you're not, right? right? And then it doesn't really say like, okay, let's actually coach you to a better outcome. So what we advocate instead is what we call a movement from cancel culture to what we call coaching culture, mm -hmm. uh, which is to say, okay, you made a mistake, but it wasn't like the end of the world and you're a person of goodwill, you want to improve. So let's actually acknowledge that, not ostracize you, but actually give you tangible skills, which we try to offer in these in this book. How do we communicate that to the broader public though? Because that is that's a very educated way of looking at this. But a lot of people just want to see someone go down in flames. Like how do we change that view of cancel culture in our society right now on social media? Like how do we change this? Yeah, I think one of the ways to change it really is one conversation at a time. So this is why we wrote this book, is we wanted people to be able to pick it up and apply it to their living rooms, to their break rooms at mm -hmm. work, conference rooms. And I think gradually through those individual everyday conversations, we can change the culture. And I think this can also be done at an organizational level. So if you're a leader of an organization, if mm -hmm. you run a business, uh, creating the kind of culture in which people are generous to those who make mistakes and we're all coaching each other to get better, that's something that you can do at an organizational level Here's as well. Here's hoping that some organizations start taking that. Um, once you move past fear, one of the things I love that you talk about in the book is curiosity. Let's talk about that. How do we cultivate that quality? 
Absolutely. So, you know, our favorite framework of looking at curiosity is, you know, to say you're in a nuclear physics seminar. Like too often we go into these uh, identity conversations and we actually, whether we say it to ourselves or not, we think we know what's going on. And so often we don't. Uh, so, you know, I could be having a conversation with you about gender and I might think like, oh, yeah, I have a woman in my life. I know everything there is to know about being a woman. And so I'm just going to refract everything Amity says through that lens. And what, you know, the uh, philosopher, Christy Dawson, and says is when don't do that instead think of yourself as being in a nuclear physics seminar if I were in a nuclear physics seminar I know I would like kick the tires on every single thing yes. that came out of your mouth if you were my professor and I would say like well wait a minute I think I understood that but I'm not sure so let me double check even if I've done all my prep all my reading what have you this is a really unfamiliar subject so let me adopt that posture of radical humility okay I love that idea of looking at these conversations through that lens now I'm gonna think nuclear physics anytime I have a, <laughs> summer, it's a hard conversation with someone I we only have about 30 seconds left but I, I just I have to ask this last question are we still allowed to disagree with someone Absolutely. And we think that you just have to be able to do it respectfully. And one simple tool for doing that is to just recognize that the conversation might mean something different to the other person than what it means to you. So, for example, if we're talking about the curriculum at your school and maybe you think that the diversity inclusion curriculum is wrong, you might think that's an issue of policy. The other person might see it as a question of their equal humanity. And so mm -hmm. I think just acknowledging the fact that you're coming from a different starting point is a really good way to approach these disagreements. I am so grateful for both of you for starting this conversation, for talking about this, for giving us kind of this guidebook to move forward. And by the way, there's so much more to learn. Kenji and David will be at Town Hall Seattle, and we've got all the details on our website. This is something you definitely need to make time for. All right, well, coming up next, Chef